Uh, welcome back to the second session of block two for 2991 subject advanced water and wastewater treatment. In this session, we will be discussing membrane processes for the water and wastewater treatment, types of membrane technologies, uh, types of membrane technologies, some of the important terms and uh, parameters used for membrane applications, and uh, some of the recent developments in the membrane separation processes. At the end of the session, you're expected to understand the fundamentals of membrane processes, uh, types of membrane processes available, and the applications for various uh, various uses, and, and some of the basic design calculations. Okay, uh, membrane uh, process is, uh, in fact, a physical separation process, or uh, a filtration process uh, similar to the sand filtration that we touched earlier in session one. But uh, the difference with this uh, sand filtration is that sand filtration and or the multimedia filter or dual media filter, they are very thick. But membrane uses very thin semi-permeable layer that will allow only the solvent such as water to pass through while retaining the contaminants uh, and removed from the water. The separation mechanisms involved in the membrane process include size exclusion, which means any particles, uh, particle or the particles of the contaminants larger than the pore size of the membrane is filtered or removed uh, by size exclusion. And uh, electrostatic repulsion is also another way of removing the the charge. Uh, particles or charged ions uh, using membranes. Adsorption is also uh, sometimes involved in the removal mechanism, but uh, because the membranes are very thin, uh, adsorption is not very significant. But uh, as uh, you will see that adsorption is quite significant in the thick uh, membrane, such as filtration, uh, thick filtration process, such as the dual media filter, sand filter media, multimedia filter, etc. The membrane process is uh, uh, actually uh, advanced from of water or wastewater treatment, and they are able to solve most of the problematic water sources, and so these have. Uh, found a very wide range of applications. Actually, in fact, membrane processes are used in many, many applications these days, including in the air purification, gas purification. Uh, membrane process is also useful for disinfection because they are able to remove most of the microorganisms uh, such as, uh, such as uh, the uh, uh, parasites, uh, fecal coliforms, uh, viruses extra that is present in water and membrane process is also effective in removing the micro pollutants these those pollutants that are present in very minor uh, very low concentration like pesticides insecticides uh, maybe pharmaceutical compounds and personal care products all these things can be removed using membranes of course depending on the pore size of the membrane uh, membrane can be classified into four major types uh, and they are all pressure driven process which means uh, the driving force to filter out the water using this membrane is the hydraulic pressure. The types of membranes are microfiltration membrane, ultrafiltration membrane, nanofiltration membrane and reverse osmosis membranes. In nano uh, MF and UF are generally called as porous membranes because their pore size are quite uh, 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 obvious that it can be seen through the microscope. Uh, whereas uh, nanofiltration and reverse osmosis membranes are generally considered as a non-porous membranes because they are, you cannot really see their pore size uh, using the microscope. The pore size of the uh, microfiltration is between 0.1 uh, uh, micrometer or 100 nanometer and 0.45 uh, micrometer. So this is. Uh, whereas ultrafiltration membrane, the size ranges from 2 to 50 nanometers 
and the nanofiltration uh, pore size ranges from 2 to 5 nanometer and whereas for ribose osmosis membranes pore, uh, the pore size is considered to be less than 1 nanometer and they essentially there are also few emerging membrane processes uh, such as uh, forward osmosis membranes uh, forward osmosis process and also membrane distillation process which is a combination of of a thermal uh, distillation process and the membrane process uh, this slide shows uh, where these uh, types of membranes these four types of membranes can be applied uh, depending on the quality of the water or the contaminants present in the water uh, depending on their relative sizes so for example if we have sand or silt particles or algae or some kind of bacteria that gives you the the colloidal uh, or suspended solid in water then generally the uh, filtration or conventional filtration using sand filter media or dual media filter or multimedia filter is effective uh, and probably aided by the flocculation and coagulation and flocculation but if you want to remove the smaller uh, size bacteria maybe clays some kind of asbestos fibers in that case then the microfiltration is effective in removing those of course it can remove all all other contaminants that is removed by sand filtration also and if you have and if you have further smaller virus uh, contaminants such as viruses then and proteins uh, then ultrafiltration membrane can be used uh, as a filtration and if you have color or or multivalent ions or hardness in water such as calcium and magnesium that's causing problem or maybe uh, the iron and manganese that gives a color problem then nanofiltration can be effective in removing all those and if you want to remove dissolved salts from water say for example sea water uh, or the brackish gallon water which there are a lot of salt then salt and salt are usually present in the form of ions in water so if you want to remove these then ribose osmosis is the the ideal choice for the membrane so for, so ribose osmosis is in fact used as a process for desalination so completely remove salt from the water the first let's talk about the microfiltration so microfiltration is uh, as i said is a porous membrane with a pore size ranging from 0.1 micrometer to 0.45 micrometer usually this the the membrane pore size that is commercially available and microfiltration is able to remove majority of the colloidal and suspended solid particles from the from the water and if you usually if you the microfiltration can be very effective in reducing the footprint of a water or the wastewater treatment plant for example if you remember in the first session we uh, we touched upon the uh, removing suspended solids from the water so the process we adopted was the coagulation uh, followed by percolation uh, which means uh, rapid mixing followed by slow mixing and then sedimentation or the clarification and then sand filtration and if you introduce microfiltration all this coagulation uh, clarification and sand filtration can be completely removed and then microfiltration can effectively uh, substitute for uh, these three or four processes so that's why the membrane processes are very very effective they can be very uh, provide a very minimum footprint uh, the footprints i'm talking about the area that the, the treatment plant can cover in uh, the land area so <clears throat> therefore sometimes the microfiltration is used as a pretreatment or prefiltration to many other advanced processes such as uh, nanofiltration and reverse osmosis membrane because they can remove all the suspended solids that can give problem of membrane falling to the 
the high pressure membrane such as NF and RO. The next uh, membrane process is the ultrafiltration process or the UF process, UF membrane. Okay, so UF um, membrane is able to remove uh, most of the the contaminants that's removed uh, by a uh, by by uh, MF and, and add in on in addition to that it can remove to uh, from uh, other uh, contaminants such as uh, iron and magnesium manganese in water uh, with prior oxidation and it can also remove bacteria viruses from the drinking water that's not removed by MF it can also remove the cryptosporium garia from the surface water and it also can remove the macromolecules such as proteins uh, from the water so uh, ultrafiltration is uh, much more effective than the microfiltration and the quality of water that you get from ultrafiltration is much uh, better than the MF membrane because the pore size of the, the UF is uh, uh, 2 nanometer to 50 nanometers so some are quite tight uh, ultrafiltration membranes as well so ultrafiltration membranes is also used uh, uh, for water reuse applications and also sometimes as a pre-filtration or pre-treatment of seawater before the 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 seawater desalination by reverse osmosis. The third type of membrane is the nanofiltration process, uh, NF membranes. The NF operates at a transmembrane pressure of around 50 to 20 bar, and it can remove uh, up to 70% of the uh, monovalent ions and uh, greater than 95% of the multivalent ions such as calcium, such as magnesium, uh, iron, manganese, etc. Because they have high valency, they can be easily removed by nanofiltration membranes. And uh, it can operate at up to 70% uh, permanent recovery rate. That means if you put 100 uh, uh, 100 liters 100 um, liters of water passed through the membrane nanofiltration membrane and 70% uh, can become a permeate uh, uh, clean water uh, whereas uh, the 30% becomes a reject uh, that we will call as a brine or the concentrate and it can remove almost 100% of the microorganisms present in water so they can give almost a total disinfection Okay, and then can, the nanofiltration can replace the chlorine and other disinfection process. And sometimes, of course, nanofiltration is also used as a pretreatment to reverse osmosis, if, especially if uh, a lot of calcium and magnesium or sulfate are present in water because when the reverse osmosis process or desalination, uh, reverse osmosis desalination is used, the scaling can be a quite a problem so if there is uh, calcium and sulfate present then the calcium sulfate is a gypsum this uh, the solubility is very low so if that saturation point uh, reaches then the RO membrane can uh, have a lot of problem from scaling of this gypsum so sometimes nanofiltration is used to remove uh, calcium from the water and sulfate from the water and then the uh, the relatively calcium and sulfate free water can be then passed to the reverse osmosis membranes for desalination. And nanofiltration is also used uh, for water softening. If you remember in this first session, we talked about the ion exchange uh, process for uh, ion exchange process for removing uh, calcium and magnesium from water to make the water soft, right? This, uh, the water hardness is caused by the presence of excess calcium and magnesium. So, because uh, nanofiltration is effective in removing the multivalent ions, because calcium and magnesium are multivalent ions, which has Ca2 plus and Mg2 plus, so nanofiltration can be effective in removing and making the water, uh, hard water, soft. 
the reverse osmosis is the the tightest is the most uh, uh, effective in removing almost everything from the water it operates a very high pressure of course if you want to do desalinate seawater for example it can go up to 70 bar or 70 bar of uh, uh, pressure to operate it because uh, uh, seawater has osmotic pressure of around 25 bar so which means uh, if you consider if the pressure loss within the system and then also to recover uh, more than 50% of the water, like uh, if you have seawater uh, 100 and if you get 50% of that as a seawater, uh, the fresh water, then you have to have a uh, very high os uh, pressure applied to overcome the increasing the osmotic pressure of the water as the, the more salts are rejected. So reverse osmosis can reject up to 99% of dissolved salts in water. It basically, uh, usually the, the commercial membrane these days are even 99.7-99.8% of salt removal, of sodium chloride removal. So it's an almost 100% removal of multiple ions. And usually seawater uh, desalination using reverse osmosis is operated at around 50% of recovery rate. Of course, you can uh, recover more than that, but uh, the, the, the amount of pressure that you will have to put will be significantly increase because the, when you operate at high, uh, higher recovery rate, the concentration of the brine will also increase which means the osmotic pressure of the feed water is will also increase so which means you have to operate at very high pressure so energy consumption will be significantly high and of course he was also reverse osmosis will remove 100 percent of the microorganisms including viruses uh, usually as i said earlier uh, nf and uf uh, nf and ro uh, membranes are considered uh, uh, non porous and their uh, separation mechanism is usually based on the solu solution diffusion model. So, reverse osmosis is generally used for desalination to achieve the ultra pure water from the uh, water containing very high uh, dissolved salts, and also it's used for the, as, uh, the purification of water for. Uh, high quality water reuse. So for example, if you want to use the, the treated wastewater for uh, very various purposes, like uh, non potable purposes, of course, like maybe for irrigation, uh, where it can pay, the water may come in contact with the food that we eat, maybe for laundry purposes, for toilet flushing. Uh, sometimes for the cooling cooling towers etc so all these uh, uh, if you want to get a very high quality water for reuse then reverse osmosis uh, process is usually applied and not only for seawater desalination so as i said uh, the microfiltration and ultra filtration can be used as a pretreatment to the, the various applications like nanofiltration and reverse osmosis process are very high pressure membranes and hence uh, it, their operation uh, without a problem uh, is very much important. So membranes can uh, get fouled uh, and membrane fouling is a big uh, challenge because it will increase the, the pressure uh, required and therefore the energy consumption. And also it can increase the downtime because the user have membrane has to be frequently do uh, chemical, chemical cleaning. So in order to avoid that problem, the microfiltration is generally used as a, a pretreatment to nanofiltration reverse osmosis so that they can remove all the, the suspended solids and other uh, the contaminants present in water. MF and UF uh, processes are generally used to reduce the falling potential of the feed water before the NF and RF process. So in most uh, RO desalination plants, uh, you will see that MF and UFF are used as a treatment process. So this, uh, the process diagram shows uh, the application of the microfiltration or 
or ultra filtration uh, in the reverse osmosis desalination or the nanofiltration uh, process. So there are a few uh, key terms uh, that is useful in the membrane process. They are often used in any uh, all the membrane processes. So the first is the feed water. So feed water is in fact the source water that is used for the treatment or for the membrane processes okay so sometimes uh, in in the we also use the term as feed solution if especially if it is if it contains uh, dissolved uh, uh, contaminants in permit waters refer to the filtrate or the filtered water or this the clean water that is passed through the membrane and concentrate or reject uh, or also brine is the portion of the feed water that is not filtered or and it is rejected uh, by the membrane processes and uh, it can contain uh, increased uh, concentration of the solids or suspended solids whatever is rejected by the membrane so which means uh, for example if you want to operate the membrane usually not 100% of the water that you send to the membrane process becomes uh, the permit water some will have to be rejected uh, and usually for nano uh, microfiltration membrane and uh, ultrafiltration membrane uh, the 100% all 100% uh, of the water the feed water can become the permit water if say you can operate uh, the membrane as a dead infiltration which means whatever you goes in has to come out as a permeate right and sometimes yeah uh, ultrafiltration is also not that uh, uh, operated 100% recovery date but for nanofiltration and ultra uh, reverse osmosis membrane there's no way that you can operate at 100% recovery date so which means if you send 100 uh, liters of water through the membrane only a certain portion of uh, the water becomes permeate and the rest has to be uh, sent as a reject uh, as a or concentrate the tmp is a transmembrane pressure so it uh, is so when you operate the the membranes they are all pressure based membranes means it means that the hydraulic pressure has to be applied to push the water through the membranes so the transmembrane pressure refers to the to the net applied pressure or the driving force that's across the membranes that uh, pushes the water uh, the pressure different membrane processes can be configured either as a dead end filtration or the coarse flow filtration so what does that mean is that uh, the water can be uh, the feed water can be applied uh, in two types of uh, uh, directions one is called the dead end which means the feed water flows uh, perpendicular to the the membrane so as uh, that as you will see over here the indeed infiltration mode, the feed water flows uh, perpendicular to the membrane and the water comes out. So which means there is no way the other uh, the water which is uh, not yet filtered will go. So it has to everything has to pass through the membrane. So what happens here is that all the the dirt, all the contaminants that's present in water, the, such as suspended solids, dissolved solids, or whatever all will be deposited in the water so we, and it, as time passes uh, during the filtration process the all this thing will deposit on the membranes increase the thickness and after some time the water coming out of the membrane will continuously decrease so it's shown from here like in the initially in the time zero you start a very high uh, permit flow head coming here and then as the time goes by then permit flow will decrease 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 and after some time no water will come out because so the membrane is completely blocked so very good example is this syringe filter that you may uh, have used in the lab here using this syringe and then you have filter here so if you clean uh, if you filter the 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 water sample here 
you will see that initially it's very easy to come uh, easy to press it and the water will easily come out from the as a, the clean water or the permeate but as time passes you will see that it becomes harder and harder and harder and the water flow decreases uh, the permeate decreases and after some time you will see that you have to put very high uh, force to filter out the water and after some time you know no water will come out even if you put a lot of pressure so this is a, a, a kind of dead end filtration mode so this is not very efficient because whatever uh, comes uh, whatever goes in is all deposited on the membrane and then they have this problem of <clears throat> sometimes you have to clean the membrane and then again clean the membrane it keeps on uh, doing that so this uh, is a problematic so now the people came up with another idea okay now why how about flowing the water parallel to the membrane or uh, trans uh, uh, in 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 transverse or in tangential right and tangential to the membrane surface so you see here that instead of flowing 90 degree or perpendicular to the membrane it is flowing the water is flowing parallel to the membrane so you have a pressure in both cases here so water will the permeate will still come out from the membrane but not all the water that is uh, 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 means the water the feed water has the the option of running through the surface and going out of the membrane surface also so which means when the water flows like that tangential to the membrane the whatever the debris or the particles that deposit on the membrane surface will be flushed out together with the, uh, the so higher the cross flow velocity the more the effectiveness is removing these uh, the particles deposit on the membrane surface so in that way this will be the if you look at this graph, initially there will be a slight <coughs> decrease in the, the output or the permit mem <coughs> from the membrane, but with time, if you operate a very constant pressure, then the, you'll get a constant uh, permit flux, so only slowly, slowly decreasing, not like a rapidly decreasing in this uh, dead end filtration mode. So cross flow filtration is the most commonly used in in the membrane processes, in all the membrane processes, but of course in uh the microfiltration and ultra filtration sometimes the dead infiltration is uh, still being used so the other terms uh, are used in the membrane processes uh, say for example if you are using a cross flow this is the this is the impact expansion of the cross flow configuration of the membrane process so say this is a membrane okay so the, you say this is a membrane cell for example and then you feed uh, the you send in the feed water with the flow rate of qf is the fuel <clears throat> and the concentration of the feed in the cf and you apply the pressure here and this is a cross flow here so whatever is not filtered here will come out as a concentrate or the reject or the brine with the flow rate of qr and cr and the the permeate which is passes through the membrane will come out here of the membrane and uh, with the flow rate of qp and also still some concentration cp because not all 100 percent of the the uh, concentration in the feed is uh, uh, rejected so some will still pass through the membrane depending on the pore size of the membrane right so this is how the cross flow configuration is set up so you can do some maths here uh, mass balance here so which means the mass balance is this is a membrane cell so it is it is like it's like a black box but whatever gives in has to come out because there's no way of accumulation within the membrane here uh, except for a little bit of fouling and so the you can do a mass balance here. So whatever comes in from here has to be equal to whatever comes out of this box, which means this equal to this plus this. So in that way, the mass balance of this one will be in two types of mass balance. One is the volumetric mass balance, and the other one is the uh, concentration or the solid mass balance. So feed water, say for example, the feed water, the water as qf should be equal to qp plus qr right so whatever comes in has to be whatever goes out plus whatever goes out here and whatever goes as a solid solute 
So for example, Cf, whatever comes in as a mass of the contaminant. So the total mass coming here will be the concentration multiplied the, the flow rate here, right? So they'll give you the total mass. So the total mass coming, the mass flow rate here, Qf into Cf will be equal to Qp into Cp. That's the mass going of the contaminants going out as a permit and the mass going out as a concentrate, which will be Qr plus Qc. So these are some of the the mass balance that you can use. <clears throat> the water flux, or sometimes denote, uh, is mostly denoted by JW, is is one of the very important parameters used in the membrane process. So in fact, it measures the volume of water passing through the unit area of the membrane in a unit time. So it's in fact uh, the measure of the throughput per unit area of the membrane. So you can calculate this uh, <clears throat> JW uh, water flux by this equation. So for example, if you have, if you open the membrane and collect the permit, so the permit in a say, certain time, so for example, one hour. So if you collect uh, uh, 10 liters of water, uh, 10 liters of water in, in, in one hour, so this will be V, into one hour and area if you use one square meter of uh, area for example one meter square of area membrane area and then the, uh, the time is one hour so you'll get the the 10 liters per meter square per hour right so you can also calculate in different ways for example what are the permit uh, flow rate you get so if you have qf coming in here the feed flow rate qp divided by the membrane area gives you the 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 volumetric flow rate uh, volumetric uh, flux right uh, jw so units are usually in terms of liters per meter square per hour we usually term as lmh or it can be meter cube per meter square per hour per second or you whatever so you can have a divide by you but anyway what it's saying is the amount of water that volume the amount of volume of water that's coming out from the membrane per unit area of membrane and per unit time. So in the USA apps, they are used a different unit uh, gallon per square foot uh, uh, per day. So rejection rate is another term uh, quite often used in membranes, uh, especially uh, for reverse osmosis membranes and nanofiltration membranes. Of course, it's used in the nano, uh, UF and MF membrane as well. So rejection is nothing but the percentage of uh, of concentration uh, contaminant that's removed from the water. So for example, if CF is the concentration of the contaminants that's coming in the water, uh, feed water, and CP is the concentration that you get as in the permit because as you said 100% is not uh, removed, rejected. So, so CF minus CP divided by CF the initial concentration if you <coughs> give as a percentage here you get the rejection rate. Okay, so this is it uh, basically says percentage of suspended solids or dissolved solids that's removed from the water. And sometimes the transmission is also another term used uh, for membrane. Uh, it uh, is is uh, one minus R. It means like uh, here in rejection rate we measure how much is removed, but in transmission we uh, we measure how much is transmitted through the membrane. So which means if you remove ninety percent or ninety nine percent of the the concentration, then uh one percent is transmitted through the membrane so this is one way of measuring and feed recovery rate is another uh term uh used very often used is the, the percentage water that is filtered to the membrane to become a permeate water okay and uh, <coughs> it, uh say for example if you send if your inlet uh, the feed flow rate is qf and out of the QF, QP becomes the permit for red, and rest becomes the reject, right? QR. So the ratio of the QP, the permit to the feed that you feed in, QF, is the recovery rate. Okay. 
So cubic you can measure in terms of meter cube per hour, meter cube per second, liter per hour, liter per second, liter per minute, whatever. Okay, so this is, but basically you're saying volume, uh, the flow rate, uh, flow rate of the, the feed and flow rate of the permeate. The next is the membrane falling. Uh, membrane operation is not uh, free from uh, operation problems, so it has a lot of uh, problems. And membrane fouling is one of the biggest challenges in the membrane processes. <clears throat> membrane fouling refers to the <clears throat> deposition of particles, so the contaminants on the membrane surface, uh, and that will lead to the reduction in the uh, the permeate output. Or the permeate flux, and uh, the uh, because of the reduction uh, in the the flux, uh, and if you want to get the same output or the throughput, you'll have to operate the membrane at the higher pressure, so that increases the energy consumption. And how do you solve this problem? And uh, the membrane falling, of course, we will talk more details later on, but yeah, it depends on the quality of the feed water. So if the feed water quality is very bad, then of course the membrane falling will also be very bad. And uh, the one of the solutions is the membrane cleaning. <coughs> and the cleaning can be done by using backwashing. So like earlier when we talked about the sand filtration or the multimedia filtration, we there is a deposit on the mem uh, the the filtration surface so uh, you cleaned it uh, by uh, reversing the flow or we can back or backwash and where we dislodge the water uh, the deposited particles on the uh, the sand surface and then you scrape it off likewise here in also membrane process such as for microfiltration and ultrafiltration membranes so they are porous membranes Backwashing can also be done. Intermittent uh, usually is done as intermittent uh, backwashing. So re the the water flows reversed of the the operation, and the whatever is deposited on the membrane surface can be dislodged. But sometimes backwashing itself is not effective. Physical backwashing itself is not effective. So there is people adopt this what is called enhanced backwash. So we use add some chemicals in the in the water, in the backwash water, and then do a chemically enhanced uh, backwashing. So it's called chemically enhanced backwashing or enhanced uh, flux maintenance, uh, and uh, it is only applicable to UF and ultrafiltration membrane. So therefore, in the uh, it's it's uh, backwashing is a form of uh, physical cleaning, but sometimes you can even do physical cleaning on the membrane surface, you know, not even reverse. So and uh, also you can do chemical cleaning on the on the cross flow conditions also to recover the flux so clean in place is one of the the terms used clean in place is actually you are cleaning the membrane at its own place like you're not uh, moving the what uh, moving the membrane to other place uh, and locating it for cleaning is not doesn't happen it is it, cleaning at the same uh, at the same uh, uh, same condition So membrane can be further classified into various categories here. Uh, earlier we have did uh, we classified it two major types, right? Uh, microfiltration, ultrafiltration, nanofiltration, and reverse osmosis membranes. They are purely based on their pore size or the the ability to re re reject the 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 size of the particles. But there are other classifications that you can. <clears throat> Uh, that you can uh, uh, learn. So the membranes are classified based on the nature, uh, based on their structure, based on their geometry, and, and based on the transport mechanism. For example, based on nature, we have synthetic membranes. So all the membranes that we use uh, are mostly polymer-based membranes. But also sometimes it is also made of organic uh, polymers and also inorganic uh, membranes are also there. Uh, stem, uh, stainless steel membranes, uh, the metallic membranes, uh, ceramic membranes. 
and also organic membranes are uh, basically made of the polymers. And the other class of the membrane is the based on the structure. Uh, we have structure uh, which is symmetric membranes and asymmetric membranes. Symmetric membranes has, if you cut the membrane in the cross section, you'll see that it's as a uniform uh, structure. But in asymmetric, it's not like that. In asymmetric membranes, you have uh, uh, you will have uh, uh, composite members basically, and, and you have a support layer which will provide the cushion to the membrane layer, and then the the, the membrane, actual membrane that rejects the salt, for example, for the reverse osmosis membranes or the the nanofiltration membranes, the rejection layer that the the actual membrane is very very thin, say around. Uh, 200 nanometers, which is around 0.2 uh, micrometer thickness, very thin. So very th thin layer of membrane has to be supported on some kind of support layer. So you have a composite membrane making the membrane asymmetry. And then by based on the geometry, we we can have a membrane which is tubular membranes, uh, tubular membranes by, and you can have hollow fiber membranes, the membranes which is very uh, uh, thin uh, uh, hollow fiber uh, and uh, flat sheet members, which is uh, usually like a, a paper, right? And and based on the transfer mechanism, we can also consider is as a dense membrane and porous membrane, dense or po uh, porous uh, non-porous membranes and porous membranes. The porous membranes are usually uh, like uh, ultrafiltration and uh, microfiltration membranes, and their uh, the transfer mechanism is based on nuts and diffusion, molecular sieving, and selective surface flow, etc. So these are some of the mechanisms for filtration. But in the dense or non porous membrane, solution diffusion is the one of the the transfer mechanism that's being uh, 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 applied, and it's also also facilitated transport. Okay. Uh, this uh, membrane design and modules. Uh, based on the geometry and, and the classification based on the geometry, we have uh, flat sheet membranes. So you see that this is flat sheet mem uh, uh, This is the flat sheet membrane uh, where the membranes are fabricated in the rolls of uh, sheet. <coughs> and hollow fiber is is uh, the fiber. Uh, and inside is a hollow, uh, it's like a tube, but uh, the fiber diameters are much smaller than the tubular uh, membranes. So tubular membranes, and these are quite uh, both uh, hollow fiber kind of thing, but uh, the tubular membranes are much bigger than the hollow fiber membranes in diameter. So based on the structural design of the membrane, we have symmetric membranes and asymmetric membranes. Symmetric membranes, uh, the structure are shown here, it can be a symmetric uh, porous membrane or a dense uh, symmetric membrane. And they have uniform pore size and thickness. And the, the, the mass transfer or the, the permeability of the water depends on the, the dot membrane resistance. Uh, and the membrane resistance depends on the thickness of the membrane. So thinner the membrane, the less resistance it has. So we prefer having a thinner membrane to have a higher permeability. The next is the um, asymmetric membrane. The asymmetric membrane itself is means that it is not symmetry, right? So here, if you look at the design here, we have uh, the different pores. Uh, uh, the top ones are the smaller pores and the bottom ones are larger pores. So they have not uniform pores. So the same, this membrane, porous membrane, may have a dense layer on the top. Then it becomes a composite membrane because the this is like a simple uh, one unit of membrane, but this is a two layer of membrane. So we usually call as a composite membrane. So these composite membranes, if you look at here, uh, we have uh, usually the even if it is a reverse osmosis membranes or nanofiltration membrane is usually of this design. You have a thin, very thin layer of uh, uh, salt rejecting membrane. Uh, it's around 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 micrometer thickness. It's around usually average around uh, 0 0.2 uh, 
uh, micrometer thickness. It's very thin. And uh, it's supported on this uh, UF like uh, uh, porous uh, membrane here. This provides like a cushion to this membrane. And then on the bottom, you have a, a non woven fabric, backing fabric. It provides, uh, it provides a mechanical strength to the membrane. Because if you have, for example, reverse osmosis membranes are operated at a very high pressure, 70 bar, 50 to 70 bar. So this is a tremendous amount of pressures exerted on the membrane. So it, the membrane has to withstand. This membrane, uh, the actual membrane uh, is very thin here, the rejecting layer. So this does the function of rejecting the thing, not all uh, other membrane layers. So they just provide the mechanical and uh, strain and cushion. So they, so they have these three distinct layers. Um, uh, this is called support layer, it's like a UF membrane. And then we have uh, thin uh, re rejecting layer we call it an active layer also so this is so because of this uh, design we call it a composite membrane or thin film composite membrane because the membrane is a very thin film support on the porous uh, support layer uh, and and further supported by the backing uh, non woven fabric so if you look at the the same images, electrons, uh, elect, uh, scanning electron microscopy image here, you'll see this kind of uh, structures. So this structure, you'll have see this kind of uh, uh, design or sometimes it's a, it's a sponge like a structure also you can see in this area. And the bottom you will see is this, uh, the uh, backing fabric. And the, the, the top layer is a very thin uh, layer that you can even hardly see. And the next is the spiral wall membrane. So we have a flat sheet membrane and the hollow fiber membrane. So now how, how this membrane can be designed to have make modules, right? So we have flat sheet membrane here. And the, fir uh, the, the first one we have is the, the spiral wall membrane. Spiral wall membrane. You can have a different diameter of the uh, spiral wall membrane, so you can, as you can see from here. So this is how it is designed. The membranes uh, uh, there is a core tube here, and the core tube, uh, and uh, the the tube has a hole inside, so that water can go in uh, inside the tube. Okay, so and then uh, several number of leaves of uh, membranes are wound, uh, spirally wound around this core tube. Okay, and between each membrane, there's a spacer, a spacer. Uh, spacer, this kind of uh, spacer, where this allows to provide a gap between the two membranes so that it becomes a channel. So on one side of the membrane, which is the the active layer side of the membrane, which has the very thin layer membrane, that uh, the feed water will flow through that. Okay, And then other side, on the support layer side, will be the permeate water flowing. So we have to have a gap for the uh, for the the water to flow right so that's why we have to provide the spacer so you have this kind of design here and the spiral one so this uh, the what the, the the figure below at the bottom shows further how this uh, membrane is designed and this membrane element or spiral one element is now uh, inserted into the housing so it's called housing. So you have a very long housing because this uh, membrane has to be subjected to pressure, right? So you cannot subject to pressure like this because this membrane is just the uh, element, and then and they are usually ordered by the uh, this plastic sheet. So they they cannot withstand high pressure itself. It's not designed to do like that. So now you have to put it in the the housing here. So all. So sometimes the up to eight elements can be fit in one housing in series, okay? So you put it inside here and then they are connected serially. So what happens is the feed water will flow parallel to the membrane here, like this parallel, and come out as a concentrate at the other side, or the reject is concentrate. And when it goes through and when the pressure is subjected to this pressure vessel, also housing is also called pressure vessel, then the water passes through the membrane because of the pressure, the driving force, and then the what the permeate water reaches on the supplementary side, and then it uh, the water spirally 
uh, goes through the membrane and finally reaches the core tube and then it comes out as a permeate here okay the, the permeate so uh, in the spiral one element membrane element the feed water flow ten tangential to the, the the length of the element whereas the permeate flows spirally uh, along uh, spirally uh, circular to the the membrane element and then finally comes out from the core tube as a the final permeate okay so you can refer to this video you'll see this uh, this video from aeronautics uh, give a very good uh, animated uh, uh, video of how the membrane elements are designed membrane is designed and how elements are, are designed and then then can be put it into housing and how it is used And the other form of uh, uh, membrane modules for flat sheet is the plate and frame modules. So this flat sheet membrane, you can make this kind of uh, flat uh, plate and frame kind of membrane modules. So and all this will be stacked together, okay? So all the stick will together to form this kind of plate and frame membrane module. So usually this type of plate and frame modules are used for submerged uh, application like a uh, membrane by reactor of course hollow fiber membranes you will see later on that hollow fiber membranes are also used for submerged membrane by reactor so this is how uh, the plate and frame membrane looks uh, the when you compare to the spiral one membrane the membrane design and uh, assembly of plate and frame is much uh, easier so it's not complicated like in the membrane element design spiral one design and then put it in the uh, housing and it's uh, relatively simple but the problem is that the footprint the the footprint of the membrane the modules and the 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 capital cost of the plate and frame mem membranes are much uh, more higher compared to spiral one membranes. So the applications uh, of plate and frame modules are uh, limited compared to the spiral one membrane uh, modules. Uh, the next type of membrane is the hollow fiber membrane, and the hollow fiber uh, by name itself indicates it's it's a fiber with a hollow inside. The it's is kind of tubular membranes, but uh, the tube tubular membranes are uh, uh, named for a much bigger diameter uh, membranes. So these membranes are uh, the hollow fiber membranes are very small. Sometimes uh, the diameter is as uh, small as or here, and. Uh, yeah, but for practical purposes, usually around uh, one to two millimeters, uh, the diameter of hollow fiber membranes have been used. So these hollow fiber membranes are now bundled into a housing here. Uh, in a housing, uh, <clears throat> in a housing here. So this is called an uh, element. So, okay, so one element. So one element of hollow fiber membrane can have you know thousands of uh, hollow fiber back there, and so this all this uh, element can be again assembled here to be, uh, to make a module hollow fiber module, and the whole <coughs> the hollow fiber membrane can also be without a housing a, a casing here, so they are completely exposed so they can be directly submerged in water or the wastewater and especially it's used in the uh, wastewater as a membrane by reactor so this part of the <coughs> uh, the fiber is uh, immersed inside the membrane by uh, the biological reactor on activated sludge uh, reactor and then uh, the vacuum is provided through which the water is sucked in and the the clean water comes through the lumen side or inside of the membrane so outer part we usually call it as have a shell side and inside as a lumen side and usually the feed water uh, the water which is dirty for example the water in the reactor uh, 
uh, is in contact on the outside of the hollow fiber membrane and the clean water comes in the inside. M membrane fabrication. The, there are uh, many different types of materials used for membrane fabrication. However, organic polymers is the most commonly used uh, uh, material for membrane fabrication because they are quite cheap. Uh, the other class of material is the inorganic membrane. They are made of ceramic and metals. Uh, organic polymers uh, used for uh, commonly used for membrane fabrication includes uh, polysulfone, polyisosulfone, polyvinylidene uh, fluoride (PVDF), uh, polypropylene, etc. And polyamide is uh, used for the the thin salt rejecting layer in the uh, membrane, such as for RO and nanofiltration. Inorganic membranes are not uh, commonly used because firstly they are quite uh, expensive and also that they are a bit br uh, they are very brittle and uh, they can easily break but they have uh, some niche applications in some uh, pharmaceutical industries or maybe some food industries because of hygienic conditions that they have to maintain and also some chemical industry where Polymeric membranes may not be able to be used because they are not uh, their thermal and chemical resistance are not as good as the inorganic membranes. While designing membrane, uh, there are a few aspects that we need to uh, consider. One is the membrane permeability, and the permeability can be controlled by controlling the porosity of the membrane, pore size, and the pore size distribution and rejection properties of the membrane is also related to the pore size the other property is the membrane thickness and the membrane tortuosity and uh, and the higher the thickness and higher the membrane tortuosity the higher the membrane resistance is so you don't want to have uh, that and the thinnest and the least uh, lowest tortuosity is the best uh, for the any membrane the other properties such as water affinity, which is the hydrophilicity, uh, surface charge are also very important for uh, membrane processes. And mechanical e strength is one of the, the aspects of the membrane that needs to also be consideration because uh, of the pressure under which this membrane has to operate. Now, <clears throat> thin film composite membranes. Most membranes that we use uh, are uh, designed as a thin film composite membranes. They are asymmetric membranes. They, they have a thick support layer on which on the top uh, is a thin layer of the semi-permeable or the highly selective membrane. For high pressure membranes such as nanofiltration and reverse osmosis, the porous support layer is sometimes further supported by a non-woven or a woven backing fabric to provide an additional mechanical strength because they when they operate at a very high pressure the membrane can be subjected to high mechanical stress the structure of the thin film composite membrane is shown here in this picture below the first is the thin that yellow part shows the thin film of the rejection layer so this is actually the ultimate the membrane and this thin film is usually made of the polyamide layer were formed by the process called interficial polymerization and this thin layer is uh, supported by the support layer we call the support layer which is the polymeric membranes made by phase inversion and uh, it's like a uf membrane actually and then uh, on the top of the UF membrane, you have this uh, the thin thin layer of membrane. So you this uh, the support layer is formed by the phase inversion method. And the the lowest uh, bottom is the backing fabric, which is usually made of a non-open PT. And uh, this provides the mechanical strength of the membrane. 
So the figure on the left shows the electroscanning microscope image of the barium uh, RO membrane. You'll see that at the bottom here is uh, the backing fabric. In between here and the top is the <clears throat> uh, on is the uh, the support layer support layer uh, this part is the support layer and on the top of the if you further uh, I would say zoom in this image the thin layer of uh, polyamide is formed on the top of this one. So interfacialized uh, interfacial polymerization polymerization is a type of step uh, growth polymerization uh, in which polymerization occurs at an interface uh, between an aqueous solution containing one monomer we call it MPD and an organic uh, solution containing a second monomer TMC. So this uh, combining these two MPD and TMC. This reaction results in the formation of a chain reaction resulting in the formation of a thin layer or polyamide layer on the top. And uh, this ultra thin is around usually on average around 0.2 micrometer thickness, it's around 200 nanometer thickness uh, on the top of the membrane sub uh, surface substrate. The total thickness of the membrane, uh, including all this thin layer and the support layer and the backing fabric, may be around 300 to 400 uh, micrometer. And imagine the thickness of the active layer, this polyamide layer, so the ejecting layer is only 0.2 micrometer, less than one uh, micrometer. So you can imagine the thickness of uh, such a thin layer and this polyamide layer uh, even though it's 0.2 micrometer thickness it can reject up to even 99.9 percent .9 of the dissolved salt from the water so they are actually the the main membrane so this shows the photo shows the the membrane fabrication process uh, usually this on the left is the in with that we do usually in the lab scale and on the right is the, the industrial scale that's done for membrane fabrication so usually when you do in the lab uh, the is the phase inversion to form the membrane we use this kind of glass, glass plate and the the knife to cast the membrane so we <coughs> Use this uh, the polymer, maybe polysulfone, maybe polyethersulfone, or or uh, PBDF, whatever. So you have this polymer made, uh, prepared, and this polymer is uh, uh, <coughs> uh, put it on the on the glass plate, and this the knife will cast, and it is you can adjust the thickness of the knife, and then it will. Okay, which once you cast it on the plate, the glass plate, then you just immerse in water, and then this, uh, the 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 membrane will be formed. So these are the industrial scale. Uh, so how this the the figure shows how they make this spiral one membrane using the flashing membrane. Of course, this is we can make only like a A4 size or maybe A3 size, uh, up to A3 size level of the membrane in the lab. But in industrial scale, they can make the you know, thousands and thousands of meters of membranes continuously. And the same thing for the fiber membrane here, yeah, they can make thousands and thousands of, of uh, meters of membranes. The next is the membrane falling. So membrane falling is one of the most problematic of any membrane processes. Uh, this is one of the most significant challenges of membrane applications and still people are, a lot of people are still doing a lot of research to improve how to uh, to reduce the impact of uh, membrane falling so membrane falling is in fact the, the accumulation of unwanted deposits on the membrane surface during the the operation so these accumulated deposits can cause internal internal falling and surface falling so which means that the the particles or these fallings as we call 
can either deposit on the on the surface or inside the membrane so in that way if you if you deposit inside the membrane it reduces it blocks the pore and also uh, the it blocks the surface of the pore so in that way reducing the permeability of the water and the throughput of the the membrane uh, treatment plant so therefore membrane falling reduces the membrane efficiency and the productivity of the membrane and thereby it increases the energy consumption so membrane membrane falling is one of the major challenges of any membrane processes if you look at these pictures here these pictures really explains the extent of the problem during the membrane operations you can see that so many so much of the the dirt can be seen on the membrane see so this shows the extent of the problem in the membrane applications and this the picture really shows the uh, microscopic images of the fallen that's deposited on the membrane surface so this completely blocks the membrane you look at uh, in the uh, you can even see here uh, this is the the membranes used for the membrane bioreactor so this membrane is submerged uh, in the the bioreactor and you can see that so much uh, sludge of the and in the activated sludge process and this uh, the 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 deposits uh, can happen on the membrane so this will completely reduce the water flux coming to the membrane so there are several types of uh, fouling so but broadly we have uh, uh, categorized into three classes inorganic fouling organic fouling and biofouling biological fouling so inorganic fouling is, is related to a colloidal fouling also say for example you may have silt you may have a colloidal particles inorganic particles and suspended particles or uh, say uh, some, it mostly it's, it's a silica particles so this can cause a membrane falling and this another uh, the problem in inner organic falling we call it membrane scaling this is mostly related to the the precipitation of the of the ions or the compounds on the membrane surface for example if you are operating a reverse osmosis membrane and you are are say desalinating groundwater for example so groundwater may have contain a lot of calcium may, uh, calcium and may contain a lot of sulfate as well so the presence of calcium ions and sulfate ions together when the uh, when the the water is uh, filter to the river osmosis membrane the calcium and sulfate ions are, are rejected on the membrane surface so as the rejection occurs the concentration at the membrane surface increases in that way the because the solubility of the calcium sulfate is low then this uh, the 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 precipitate on and the scale will form on the membrane surface so this picture shows here the a microscopic image shows the thick layer of scale uh, gypsum formed on the membrane surface you look at this here so this will completely block the membrane and uh, scale the membrane so in that way the water flux will significantly reduce so the scaling may be also because of the calcium phosphate or the magnesium phosphate or maybe calcium carbonate or uh, magnesium carbonate silica all this can contribute to scaling the other one is the organic uh, fouling so organic fouling is 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 uh, because of the presence of organic matter or dissolved organic matter in the water feed water for example so if see in the natural organic matter such as humic acid fulvic acid it can be present anywhere in the natural water even in nature so it will be there in the sea water as well So any organic matter or dissolved organic matter present in the the, uh, the water, they themselves will attach on the membrane surface and foul. And besides that, it will this organic matter will act as a food. 
for the bacteria and other microorganisms and this microorganisms can stick on the membrane because there's a food source and they can further accelerate the, the membrane falling so this is one of the, the problems in the in the membrane processes so biological falling is the another uh, class of falling it's all because of the presence of bacteria and other microorganisms such as yeast fungi algae all this can contribute to the to, to bio falling so in the bio falling what can happen is the the when there is a food source coming from the dissolved organic matter in the in the water these uh, bacteria or the microorganisms can stick on the membrane surface and uh, and survive on the food organic food right organic matter and then they will multiply when they multiply they will uh, eat the, the organic matter and also they will release uh, a slimy thing kind of called we call it eps extracellular polymeric substances so this is like a very like a glue sticky so this will cover the whole membrane surface and then reduce the permeability of the membrane so this three are the major uh falling problems in any membrane processes if you look at the picture uh, the figure here you will see the the fluorescent images of the the e coli here so if you have all these colonies will be formed on the membrane surface and they can significantly reduce the membrane uh, uh water flux and uh, so the throughput and then increases the energy consumption of the membrane process so the mitigation of membrane falling so this is this is uh, there are two ways you can do it one is uh, restoring the membrane performance after the membrane has been already fouled or uh, applying a preventive measures to reduce the falling of course you cannot completely eliminate falling there's no no pos not possible unless you use a very very clean uh, organic matter free scaling compound free uh, but otherwise in in any membrane operation for water treatment scaling and membrane falling is definitely going to happen so however you can the, the once the membrane is fouled what are the process uh, what are the methods adopted to clean or and then restore the membrane performance one is physical cleaning and this physical cleaning includes backwashing with using the compressed air to disclose deposits uh, on the membrane surface but this is effective only for mf and uf and i already discussed this one earlier and chemical cleaning is another one that you use acid cleaning or or base cleaning uh, or sometimes uh, the, the companies uh, have their own pri uh, proprietary uh, cleaning agents uh, uh, supplied by the supply together with the membranes. Disinfection is another way of reducing, uh, of to, uh, what's restoring the thing, uh, biofouling. If it is completely biofouled, then you can clean the uh, membrane by adding biocides or any other disinfection uh, not uh, the chlorine because chlorine can attack the polyamide layer and uh, but uh, some other form of disinfection can also be applied to to restore the membrane performance now to prevent or to reduce the 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 what are the mitigation measures that can be done to 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 reduce the falling rate one way is uh, applying the cross flow operation instead of depth and filtration so that's i already discussed it earlier because if you do a depth in operations then in the all the uh, the cross uh, the the fallings will be deposited on the membrane surface and it will not be uh, taken away from the membrane surface or or flushed away from the membrane surface so that's the reason why most uh, uh membrane processes are uh are operated in a cross flow operations mode and also the operating the membrane at a at a critical flux at a critical flux or below the critical flux so critical flux is the flux at which if you operate above that limit then you can accelerate the following 
So there's a phenomenon called the concentration polarization. What happens is when you filter the membrane, uh, the, the water through the membrane, the contaminants present in the water is rejected by the membrane at the membrane surface, right? So at the membrane surface, the concentration of the pollutants or any other uh, the particles present in the water, the concentration suddenly increases at the membrane surface. So when it increases, when it increases, the 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 falling occurs. So if you operate the the membrane at a very high flux, then this concentration is even going to increase much. So that's why if you operate at a very high flux, the membrane falling will shoot. The falling will but the falling rate will increase, and then within a very short time, your membrane will be completely fall. So instead of operating at a very high flux at a high pressure. It's better to operate at a lower pressure, at a lower flux, and but uh, the falling rate can be, and the membrane can be operated for a very long time without uh, fall, uh, without much uh, impact of falling. So the addition of uh, biocidal or this uh, biocidal can also prevent membrane falling. Free treatment of the feed water is one of the most uh, adapted uh, approach in, in seawater or any other desalination process. Uh, pre treatment includes uh, pre uh, involves uh, removing all this uh, uh, fouling from the water. So for example, if organic fouling is the problem in the in the reverse osmosis process, then what we do is you uh, treated the water in such a way that you can remove as much as possible the organic matter from the water in that way organic matter organic falling can be prevented and if organic matter is not there then it also reduces the chances of biological of falling as well and the other one is to optimize the membrane cleaning efficiency uh, let's do some basic uh, membrane calculations. So this uh, there is a question here. The question says a membrane unit has an effective membrane area of 20 square meter. It's operated under cross flow condition of 0.8 bar applied pressure and a feed flow rate of 50,000 liters per day, producing a permeate flow rate of 45,000 liters per day. The feed water has a turbidity of 30 NTU, while the turbidity of the permit was measured 1.0 NTU. Calculate the following, uh, following from the provided information above. Water flux, specific water flux, uh, recovery rate, and the turbidity removal or rejection rate. So if you have this kind of a problem, uh, it's a very simple problem, so it's just for you to understand what how the parameters are calculated. So the <clears throat> the the this uh, this configuration shows uh, the membrane process here. Okay, we have feed water uh, with the flow rate of QF and concentration of CF. This, this is uh, the turbidity in our case. You have a membrane here in flowing in the cross flow mode. And the permeate is given by QP and the permeate concentration is given by CP. And whatever is not uh, goes through there is rejected here as a concentrate of brine or reject it is a flow rate of QR and concentration of CR. So QF is given 50,000 uh, liters per day. QP is also given here, which is 45,000 liters per day. Uh, total membrane area, the area of this membrane is given as 20 square meter. And they applied pressure is uh, 0.8 bar the concentration of the feed is 30 ntu and the concentration of the permit is uh, cp is 1 ntu so you're asked to find these uh, four param parameters so we
the first is the JW is the water flux is equal to the the permit flow rate divided by the area of the membrane so membrane area is given 20 square meter uh, permit flow rate is given 45,000 liters per day okay so if you substitute this one you will get uh, 2250 liters per day uh, liters per meter square per day okay but uh, usually the flux is given in terms of liter per meter square per hour so let's convert this day into hour uh, which will be divided by 24 and we'll get uh, jw with the water flux is equal to 93.75 liters per meter square per hour and specific water flux is nothing but the water flux per unit applied pressure so jw is 79.35 uh, 93.75 divided by the applied pressure is 0.8 bar this will give you 117.2 liters per meter square per, per hour per bar so this is a specific water flux the third one is the recovery rate so recovery rate is given by the ratio of qp divided by qf the permit flow rate divided by the feed flow rate multiplied by 100 so this will give you 90 percent of the feed recovery which means 90 percent of the feed water that you send into the membrane becomes the the product water or the permit water the turbidity removal rate or the rejection rate is equal to the turbidity inlet minus the ter turbidity in the uh, permit divided by the uh, initial uh, inlet turbidity so this will give you a 96.7 percent of uh, turbidity rejection rate so this is uh, quite a simple uh, membrane calculation and this is another example any water treatment plant uh, of 100 uh, MLD means million liters per day capacity is to be built using hollow fiber membrane microfiltration membrane process the nominal pore size of the membrane is 0.1 micrometer the water flux of the uh, mf membrane was tested in the lab using the real water sample and showed an average water flux of 50 liters per meter square per hour at 0.5 bar applied pressure at a recovery rate of 98 percent each hollow fiber module has a total membrane area of 100 square meter okay calculate the following the total membrane area required for the water treatment plant the total membrane module required for the water treatment plant the volumetric flow rate of the water required for the water treatment plant and the flow rate required of the reject what's the flow rate of the reject or the brine produced from the water treatment plant so the following uh, so i have just taken out here the qp the permanent flow rate is nothing but the capacity of the plant because this is the amount of water that you go to uh, product water they're going to get from the water treatment plant right so qp is 100 mld or 100 million liters per day and jw is given 50 liters per uh, hour per uh, meter square per hour at 0.5 bar area of one holy fiber membrane module is 100 square meter recovery rate has been given as 98 percent and the delta p uh, the applied pressure as 0.5 bar
uh, in this slide shows the the application of the membrane process for surface water treatment so this uh, the figure above shows the conventional uh, water treatment train the surface water treatment train this uh, this was uh, uh, discussed in the session one as well and then you have all this uh, uh, the all this unit processes bar screen followed by grid chamber then you have a flash mixing or the rapid mixing the flocculation uh, for a uh, rapid mixing for coagulation followed by floating uh, flocculation uh, which is slow mixing and then sedimentation and followed by filtration right and then disinfection and then supply to the distribution system so this is the conventional uh, this is the conventional uh, treatment system how about the below shows the how what are the the unit processes in the conventional treatment plant can be replaced by the membrane process you will see that uh, after the grid chamber if you apply this uh, microfiltration or ultrafiltration you don't need the the flow coagulation flocculation sedimentation and filtration so all this can all these four processes can be simply replaced by the membrane filtration okay membrane processes either ultrafiltration membrane or microfiltration membrane and the water that's used uh, collected clean water collected in the tank it can be used for back washing you want so you put the after that you add the disinfection and then supply to the the distribution network so you there's significant saving in the 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 footprint of the water treatment plant if it is uh, applied with the uh, membrane technology so that's the advantage of the membrane technology and if you have uh, of uh, of water containing uh, a lot of microorganisms such as cyst or cyst bacteria partial virus virus and if they are to be removed partially then you can use uh, microfiltration or ultrafiltration membrane for example if you use microfiltration membrane here then before you distribute you need to do the disinfection right so because this may remove only partially some of the larger bacteria but may not be removed virus but if you use uh, ultrafiltration membranes then yeah some uh, most of the virus can also be removed except for a few species and then after this permit before distribution then you can disinfect the ultrafiltration or ozone but if you're doing ultrafiltration and uh, ozone there will be no residual disinfectant left in the distribution system so that's why you have to have a disinfection uh, again addition such as chloramine or chlorine so that you can have a residual uh, residual um, disinfected within the distribution system to prevent reinfection and if you, uh, other way could be to use the chlorine itself or chlorine dioxide or chloramine and supply to the distribution system with uh, uh, with some residual uh, chlorine so these are some of the various options that you can do using mf or uf uh, for water treatment there are a few other uh, advanced treatment that we can think about uh, using membrane processes for water treatment, surface water treatment. So you may have coagulation, sedimentation, ozonation, then followed by sand filtration. And after sand filtration, you can have a nanofiltration. And nanofiltration is basically to remove dissolved organic matter that's present in water because uh, sediment, uh, the coagulation, sedimentation, and ozonation may not remove all of them. And also nanofiltration can be useful for the removal of uh, uh, removal of the <clears throat> what do you call the magnesium and calcium the heart that causes a what what hardness right so this can be applied here and after that disinfection then you can supply it to the drinking water supply network and the same thing you can repeat here but uh, instead of sand filtration you can even use the microfiltration so microfiltration can provide better water uh, quality than the sand filtration 
and then followed by an filtration, disinfection, and then supply to for the thinking purposes. So then a filtration will also remove the dissolved natural organic matter or the water softening. So these are some of the 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 application of the membranes for uh, membranes for or surface water treatment. Reverse osmosis uh, process is not generally used for for the surface water treatment because of the relatively clean uh, water and also that the, this the, the target is not the dissolved uh, solids or dissolved ions uh, and uh, reverse osmosis is mostly used for desalination purpose uh, in the next uh, couple of slides, I will be sharing some of the the recent uh, uh, and emerging uh, membrane technologies, uh, some of which uh, are still in the the research stage, and some are at the pilot scale uh, testing uh, stages. Uh, so. <clears throat> This includes uh, the reason uh, why such membrane, new membrane technologies are, are emerging is because of some issues with the, the current technologies. Uh, the, for example, if you want to apply <coughs> reverse osmosis technology for desalination of seawater, the, we have uh, in fact now the, uh, the most advanced uh, uh, reverse osmosis, seawater reverse osmosis desalination all over the world. Uh, the the tech, in terms of technology, they uh, are they are really matured. However, the still a challenge for many other countries who are not able to afford because of the high capital cost and the high uh, operating cost. Because uh, the seawater reverse osmosis has to operate at very high pressure, and which means a tremendous amount of uh, oper uh, energy operation energy then also because they have to be operated at high pressure the materials that they use for pipeline has to be also very high grade and using stainless steel and other uh, high grade materials so this uh, increases the capital cost also membrane falling is another problem this reduces the the permit plus increases the energy cost and also the chemical cost of the cleaning plant down level. So we still have the issues. So in order to overcome this issue, people are working on to find new ways of uh, of, uh, of alternative form of membrane processes. So the one is the engineered os osmosis. Uh, they include uh, forward osmosis, pressure retard osmosis, and pressure assisted osmosis then we have membrane distillation membrane capacitive deionization electrodialysis reverse electrodialysis to generate energy but i'll be briefly talking about the engineer osmosis and membrane distillation so one of the reasons why reverse osmosis uh, consumes a lot of energy is because it has to be operated at using high pressure because if you the, the seawater has the osmotic pressure of around 25 bar. So you need to apply at least 25 bar to get the water, uh, uh, more than 25 bar to get the water out of the day to overcome the osmotic pressure. So usually it operates at around 25, uh, 60 to 70 bar to get about 50% of the water, the recovery rate uh, of around 15%. So because of that then there's a lot of energy consumed so we are looking at something where we have can get water with minimum uh, pressure so non-pressure membrane so we for osmosis is one uh, the process based uh, which is a non-pressure process and this fo is based on the natural osmotic process this uh, the figure here uh, below we explain the difference between forward osmosis and reverse osmosis. In reverse osmosis, what we do is you have a seawater and uh, and we have a membrane here that allows uh, the only water to pass through and retain the salt. So you put a very high pressure here and, and this pressure using as a driving force, the clean water passes through the membrane 
and you get a clean water on that side and they concentrate on each side. So this is the peculiar uh, process uh, in reverse osmosis. But in forward osmosis, what we do is, for example, we use the natural osmotic process, the idea of natural osmotic process. We have a uh, seawater here and the clean water or, or maybe water with less concentration uh, set salt on the other side. So what we do is here, we put a semi-permeable membrane here and uh, because of the concentration difference between the two, this uh, seawater being the, the higher concentrated solution, then the, the water will be pulled by the seawater. Uh, the clean water from here will be pulled by, using, uh, by the, the seawater uh, because of the osmotic driving force and then this becomes diluted, right? It becomes diluted and then it's after some time it will stop when the equilibrium reaches. So this concept is exactly what happens in our uh, living cells because uh, you know that osmosis is the movement of water from one side of the membrane to the other side of membrane until the concentration is equilibrium, right? So this is same concept has been engineered here. So what we tried to do was to, okay, how we can apply this one to desalinate, maybe seawater or wastewater or the brackish gun water. So taking advantage of the natural, natural osmotic process, we use here a very high concentrated draw solution and any water sources, which is saline water sources, maybe even wastewater here. And when, they par when both pass through the membrane, because this has high osmotic pressure, the clean water from the other side will be pulled to the and then this get diluted and once they get diluted you can uh, be processed using a uh, low pressure or low energy process here and to recover this draw solution and then keep recycling and uh, recycling again so in the process you get a clean water drinking for drinking the success of this uh, effort desalination of course depends on how much energy is consumed for separation of this process. So, so far we have been uh, struggling to find the best uh, kind of draw solution here where it can be easily separated with minimum energy. So people have been using uh, ionic solutions. People are using uh, uh, the, of course, sometimes even they use the same sodium chloride draw solution as a draw solution. And sometimes they, use uh, even nanoparticles, magnetic nanoparticles say draw solution because it can be easily recovered by magnetic forces. So there are so many ideas have been thrown around but still making it an, uh, a, a practical has been a challenge so far. So, so if, but the effort can be very ideal if you don't have to really worry about the, the diluted draw solution and having to recover because that is still involves energy. But the idea here we got was, okay, if you, in agriculture, you require a lot of uh, water for irrigation, right? And if, say, for example, if you don't have uh, fresh water, and what you have is only uh, brackish water, then how can we use this one to, this uh, effort process to desalinate and get clean water for irrigation? So in, you'll see that for in, in, agri uh, in the farming, the, the, lot of fertilizer is used so if we use this fertilizer to to concentrate the fertilizer to extract water by FGF process uh, if then we dilute this fertilizer solution and if the if it's dilute enough we can use it directly for fertigation so you don't have to uh, separate it again recycle it like that uh, so and that this avoids the need of the separation process. So we found that this is quite ideal for uh, for, for, for for irrigation. So we call it fertigation, means it's fertilized irrigation because it, this water contains fertilizer in dilute form. And uh, you require, still require some energy for pumping to bring it in contact with membranes. So you, solar energy and wind energy can also be used. So this was actually, in fact, the uh, the the work uh, during my PhD and we tested this <coughs> uh, process at the pilot scale level in one of the gold mining sites in New South Wales which uh, we had this we still have this pilot plant in in UTS and we set up this one installed this one in the uh, mining because they produced uh, 
saline water uh, from the mining activities, coal washing, and we desalinate the water using the FTFO process and uh, test fertigation of uh, tough grass and the tomato plants were carried out and we found that uh, this technology is uh, uh, suitable for or technically feasible for for uh, growing the crops the other uh, the other application of FTF process was for the treatment of uh, wastewater and then use it for, for irrigation of the oven farming or this kind of green building so in uh, you will see that in the uh, session three membrane bioreactor is uh, one form of advanced treatment and uh, here the we want to replace this uh, normal uh, uh, uf uh, base mbr with the osmotic mbr and we use fertilizer as a draw solution and extract this water dilute the, the water from the bioreactor so in the process treating the wastewater and dilute it in the fertilizer solution and then apply it to to the the ornamental plants or the urban farming for irrigation purpose we even tested this uh, concept in the growing of the pak choy in collaboration with the <coughs> royal botanical garden in sydney and we found that it's very suitable for growing the the vegetables and osmotic power is another uh, application of the os uh, engineered osmosis. See, <clears throat> when seawater and the river water mixes, uh, this uh, gives free energy of mixing is produced. So we want to exploit that to generate osmotic power. For example, seawater has a osmotic pressure of 25 bar and uh, river water may have less than one bar, uh, uh, depending on the, uh, the dissolved solids, total dissolved solids. So 25 bar is equivalent to around 250 meters of water head. So which means, if for example, if you have fresh water, river water, and a clean river water, and the sea water separated by a membrane here, then because of the osmotic pressure of the sea water, you can increase the you, you you will pull the water from the fresh water, dilute the seawater, and raise its uh, level up to theoretically up to 250 meters. It can go up, so which means you have can gain 250 meters of head to run the turbine and get the osmotic power. So this is the concept of the the osmotic uh, power. So here what we do is we use this uh, pressure retarded osmosis. is is a kind of uh, of for uh, osmosis uh, only but except that the 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 a pressure certain amount of pressure is applied on the draw solution so for example if you have this uh, explains here this figure explains here so you have salt water here okay and it's uh, passed to one side of the membrane and you have uh, river water or fresh water on the other side of the membrane so because seawater has high osmotic pressure the clean water from the river water will be pulled to the uh, membrane and then in the process what happen is you try to put a little bit of pressure on the other side on the draw solution side and when you put the pressure it will try to retard the water coming from the fresh water side but but because of the osmotic pressure difference the water keeps coming and when you when the water keeps coming we, if you try to push that that produces that energy that extra energy and you can run the turbine to generate uh, electricity so this is the concept of uh, generating osmotic uh, po uh, power so the, we still are, our group is still working on this and and quite a number of people around the world are working on this application the another one is the membrane distillation so this is uh, 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 basically a combination of the thermal and membrane process together the when you heat the water here for example uh, the water has a partial vapor pressure and if on the other side you have a cold water and so there is a temperature uh, difference between the two and in between is the membrane so the membrane has a specific uh, properties it has a hydrophilic properties which means it doesn't allow the uh, the 
hot water, hot uh, feed water, say for example sea water, to come in to pass through the membrane. But it only allows the vapor to pass through because the vapor is created because of the the vapor pressure difference between the hot water and the cold water on the other side. So this temperature difference creates a vapor pressure difference, and this temperature pressure difference works as a driving force to for the the water vapor to pass through the membrane and contents here, and then you can collect as a permeate. And uh, theoretically, this can, uh, because only vapor can pass through, the, theoretically it can reject 100% of the salt. But of course, sometimes there's a problem because the membrane, after some time, even though it's very hydrophobic, after some time it can uh, weight the membrane. If the membrane gets wet, then of course, then the clean, the salt water can pass through, and then you get the salt, salty water on the other side. So this is. Uh, uh, a bit of problem but the advantage of this is that in normal distillation you have to heat this water to 100 degrees celsius at least to get uh, steam and then your know, content this contents is steam to get clean water right but here you don't have to heat up to 100 degrees celsius you can heat up to uh, 60 to 80 degrees celsius and that's enough to to uh, uh, achieve that uh, uh, vapor pressure difference here and then uh, conduct the membrane distillation process and the, the the advantage of this is that it applies it use very, uh, operates a very low pressure so so this are one of this is one of the recent developments but uh, the problem is that it's still the membrane is susceptible to fouling and once it's fouled then it uh, it can um, wet the membrane and then loses its hydrophobicity and then the water uh, the rejection will decrease and uh, the membrane plays a very important role in the all this membrane process whether it's for osmosis whether uh, forward osmosis whether it's reverse osmosis whether it is membrane distillation so that's why we are also working a lot in this area uh, doing research and we are making membranes uh, we are also making flat sheet membranes we are making hollow fiber membrane also making uh, uh, we are making all the sort of membranes uh, electro spinning is another interesting technique for the fabrication of, of flat sheet uh, membranes uh, they are quite advantageous because they can uh, they are able to fabricate membranes which are very thin and very high porosity and in, this is the as i said earlier the objective of the membrane is to make as highly porous as possible and as uh, as thin as possible because uh, and if you have thin and highly porous membrane then the mass transfer resistance is low and then you can have high permeability and, and a better transport uh, uh, properties and then you can have high flux. So um, uh, the electro spinning is used in our uh, research for the fabrication of forward osmosis membranes, uh, pressure retarded osmosis membranes and the membrane distillation. But however, because we uh, we because when you apply it for a uh, little bit of pressure based membrane such as uh, uh, pressure retarded osmosis for osmotic uh, uh, power generation they are a bit challenging because of the low mechanical strength so the 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 approach used here is that uh, you uh, you put the polymer in the uh, in the syringe here, and the uh, uh, and there is a collector drum here, uh, which is on the ground and high voltage. Uh, and because of the very high voltage uh, difference between the nozzle and the the, root, uh, the ground here, the polymer automatically jets out of the uh, the the nozzle here, and in the process. Uh, nanofiber, uh, uh, nanofiber, something like uh, 100, 500, uh, I mean 50 nanometers to 100 nanometers of microfiber is formed, uh, spinning is formed. So when the drum rotates, 
all this fiber is collected on the uh, on the drum and finally you get a flat sheet uh, membrane and so the, either you can use this membrane as it is for some purpose or that you can use this on a support layer uh, support layer to support layer to make a, a membranes so so this is, uh, this uh, technique has been applied for various other membrane application but in our group we are working on developing uh, forward osmosis membranes and membrane distillation uh, this is the end of the session 2 lecture and uh, i uh, we have one more session left uh, session 3 so session 3 will be uh, please tune into other uh, recorded video for the session 3 so we will in the session 3 we will be covering the wastewater treatment uh, processes uh, and mostly on the conventional activity slash process in the membrane bioreactor